statistics, and then for a while I found out, like, oh, man, it's really easy to lie with statistics. <laughs> so then I was like, oh, you kind of did me wrong. And then I got interested in looking at, like, how we could do a little bit better. So I think one of the things that's really important in your work is sometimes it's like, this close and you're thinking about your problems and your things and what you're trying to get done and it's sometimes really interesting to step back and look at maybe how other uh, fields use metrics, how people count things in other places. So, Sorry to interrupt oh. you. I completely forgot the microphone. I'm loud anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, but we are recording this, trying to make it available. Uh, okay. I'm sure Kevin was thinking. How's that? that? Sorry. All right. Um, so memory is actually really strange. There are all these stories about people having a distinct recollection of having done something that if you go back and look, it's impossible. Like uh, a really famous example was uh, we look like there was folks who asked people about their experience on 9-11, the uh, day that the Twin Towers fell in New York. And people had these distinct recollections. And then it was like, wait, you didn't, you were living in Queens then. There's no way that you were like across the street. This is ridiculous. But because the brain like layers things in, like you remember things that actually didn't happen. Um, and so, so I guess what I'm saying is we're not perfect. So when we try to do things with computers or like with metrics and get a, a clear, real picture of the truth, um, we're starting with some uh, imperfections already built in. Uh, and the key is to not like perpetuate the mistakes, right? Uh, so this is, if you can't see it, it says, <laughs> Facebook grammar friend, did you mean Facebook G-R-A-M-M-E-R? And so enough people have misspelled grammar this way that now when you go to Google, like, you know, and I don't know if this is still the case, maybe they fixed it, but it will suggest the bad spelling that many, many people use. 
So, uh, so this is this is sneaky. Like it's um, you know, like we're trying to train computers to be like us, which might not be the best goal all the time. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's but like the you know dolphins are not stepping up to the task. So I guess it remains to us to program computers and have them do things. Um, <laughs> So I want to talk a little bit about stereotypes, and one. So I uh, a book, Whistling Vivaldi, and it has a number of generally interesting studies. But one thing is that we're actually capable of stereotyping ourselves, which is super weird, right? So um, so they did a test, uh, and this is in the U.S. And they asked Asian American women to take a math test, and on the first test they were grouped with other women. And in the second test, they were grouped with other Asian Americans. So the stereotype is that women are bad at math, all right? And so, and then there's another stereotype that Asian Americans are good at math. So what happened was that Asian American women performed more poorly on the math test. Not a lot, they didn't tank it, but like a little bit more poorly when grouped with other women. Because they were like, oh, the point in this study is to see how women are at math. And I guess, you know, we're bad at it, so. Um, and then in the other one, they were like, oh, the point of this study is to show, like, how Asian Americans are good at math. So obviously, like, I'm good at math. So just believing that you were part of a group that was bad at math or good at math affected the results. So when I say that, like, you know, when people talk to you about when you're taking metrics or you're calling a group by a certain name or you have a question that is weird or leading, like when they say it matters, it matters. Like you already have it inside the ability to stereotype yourself. So it's very easy to stereotype someone else um, without being aware of it. I don't think that many of us are aware of stereotyping ourselves. We just do it. So um, another thing that's interesting, this one is a fictional example. Uh, is timing. Like sometimes it's very easy to like assign significance to the timing of something. Has anyone read the book Dahlgren by Samuel Delaney? All right, so I don't have to get the details right because no one's read it. It's a great book. Um, so it's set in this like near future post apocalyptic world. Um, for some reason, it's probably a, approximately Chicago. For some reason, the city's been cut off and they don't have electrical power anymore. And no one knows why. There's a million conspiracy theories going around on like why they got cut off, what happened, blah, blah, blah. So everyone is suspicious and stuff all the time. We still have to get things done. So, um, so the main character, the kid, he never gets another name, uh, has roommates like you do. Even in the, <laughs> even the, in apocalypse, in the apocalypse, you're still going to have roommates. Um, and, um, and so he had this glass of water. Like, so an interesting thing uh, about modern society is that water that comes from the tap is typically has bubbles in it. The reason, and like sometimes you'll see them, sometimes you don't, depending on how strong the bubbles are. And the reason is because anaerobic bacteria can live in the water. So if you put water, if you put air in it, it kills any anaerobic bacteria before you drink your glass of water. So yay. So he started noticing that. Uh, the glass of water he was drinking each day had fewer and fewer bubbles in it. And so he had all these theories. He thought, like, they, like, was it the government? Was it aliens? Was it, like, some rival city? Was, like, messing with the water. Um, and it was, like, a little bit each day, like, a little bit fewer bubbles each day. And then he saw his roommate doing the dishes. And his roommate was doing the worst possible job on the dishes. It wasn't the water at all, it was just a roommate doing a more and more haphazard job of washing the glasses. So, but it was like, all, because he was primed for conspiracy and like looking for uh, like them messing with us and all these kinds of things, like he immediately jumped, like the timing means like obviously now they're messing with the water. So, um, you know, so like it's, it's, uh, it's easy to assign timing like outsized significance. Um, oops, this one, well, all right, uh, one of these slides got messed up, but okay. So, um, so history and context. Um, X don't Y is what that other slide says. Oh, a lot of these are messed up. Um, sorry about that. So, um, so I have a 
friend in the U.S. and like a number of years ago we were talking and she said African Americans don't swim. And I thought, oh, well, you're African American. You're telling me that people don't swim. And, um, and uh, I had heard it from also from like comedians. It's like a joke in some ways, but it's also not a joke. Um, about 70% of African American children can't swim or can only swim a little bit. And then like, occasionally people drown because they can't swim. Um, and so you might think like, oh, that's kind of like a weird thing that African Americans don't swim. Maybe it's cultural, like how, like I'm a white person, Protestant, and my parents like martinis and meatloaf and hate spicy food, and it's just how they are. Like, but if you knew the history and the context, then it might be a little different. So if you ran a community pool, you might be tempted to be like, well, we don't have to like ask any questions about whether African Americans are showing up because they don't swim. Um, but if you uh, understood the history, the uh, swimming began in the U.S. in the like, public pools in the 1920s and 30s. And they were segregated. And they were segregated sometimes with police force and, uh, and violent interactions. So uh, Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, famously went to a pool in Las Vegas in 1952. And he was famous enough that they didn't mess with him, but they drained the pool after he got out. So that was like, uh, you know, it, it was this really weird thing. So, um, so African Americans don't swim just not because they're like, eh, pools, but because there's this violent history of enforcing segregated pools. So um, we're going to, oh, just those two slides, okay. And, uh, and that continues today. This person, this is just from like two years ago. It had a, it's like an apartment complex with a pool. There's a black woman in his pool. and he caught up. She lives in the building, but he'd never seen her because they're, uh, well, they're not friends. Um, and so he called the police. And, uh, and, but someone caught him and, like, talking about how, like, you know, he's supposed to know who's in the pool or whatever. Um, and obviously it's not true that African Americans don't swim. This is Simone Ashley Manuel, and she won an Olympic medal for swimming, the gold, in 2016. So, um, if you find yourself cutting a corner like, oh, we don't have to count this group, or we don't have to track this metric, you might ask yourself, why does everyone cut this corner? You may be uh, contributing to like a historical uh, inequity. You may be helping to continue a history of violence and uh, people being excluded from things that they would want to be at. And so, uh, so, you know, when you think about the categories that you make and who you count and what you count, maybe trying to be a little more like uh, Mr. Rogers and just assume the inclusion. This is a famous moment on the Mr. Rogers television show. Did you all watch that in Europe? And I mean, I, I, I know the U.S. kids, it was like kind of inescapable, which is great. Um, but this is his uh, friend, uh, Officer Clemens, who uh, he decided to share the pool with on TV. And um, it was a very specific moment. So. Um, so yeah, maybe try and be that spirit. Just assume that your friend wants to join you in the pool, whether it's your community pool. Maybe the pool is a metaphor for your community. Um, so, um, oops, some of these got that. Uh, so the power of categorization is, uh, so when you're deciding to track different things, you get to put them into categories, right? So um, a couple of these grabbed a different slide background. Um, Anyway, so this person wrote a book called Paris and Other Disappointments, right? So that's a really weird category, right? If, like, you can pretty much assume he did not enjoy Paris. <laughs> it's expensive. There's a lot of stairs. I think it outweighs the, you know, the croissants and stuff outweigh that, but, um, but he didn't think so. So if I, wrote, if I wrote a blog post that said, like, Python and other things that make you want to stab yourself in the face, you'd be like, <laughs> oh, you don't like Python. Okay, so, like, you know. Or, uh, or something like that. So when you make, like, I hope that we don't put things in our metrics like star contributors and jerks who left. You know, like that is very far from neutral, obviously. <laughs> like, so, um, so the way that we choose categories, it's, it makes a huge difference. Um, and a lot of times there's, a lot of, there's many different factors going on at once. So um, uh, you probably know Asia is really, 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 really big. Um, and so I went, I used to work in politics and I went to this session 
And they were talking about Asian American voters and trying to infer some like thing that would be the same so that they could figure out a strategy to get Asian American voters out of their house to vote for their candidates. Um, and that's just, it's too big. Um, so uh, we have like first generation immigrants, we have uh, second generation immigrants. There are like at least a dozen different countries that people have come from, and there's a huge diff like, difference in wealth. So uh, this is um, from the Brookings Institute. So we talked about how there's this uh, stereotype that Asian Americans are good at math, um, and that's true when, like other people from other groups, they have access to a good school. That's not rocket science. You live in a nice neighborhood, you have a good school, you're more likely to be good at school. Um, but like, that's not the case for all groups. And that has to do with when you came to the US, what your parents do for a living. For a while, for certain groups, you could only come if your parents had like an advanced degree, like were a scientist or a doctor or something like that. It turns out that children of scientists and doctors of any race actually are pretty invested in school and their parents are pretty excited to make sure that they get to live in a neighborhood where they go to a good school. So like trying to make this broad generalization of one group that may be a small part of your district based on like what when you break it out is like dozens of different factors uh, is kind of ridiculous. So it was a really ridiculous session. Like um, anyway, so if you make a category that is like too general, like be careful of inferring like, oh, well, I've got two people. So obviously we can make this huge inference like everyone from Iowa loves Python and other things you said, want to stab yourself in the face with. But, um, you know, it's like, you, so you can't, you can't extrapolate from too small of a sample and you may find that like a group that you're looking at is actually like way too general. So, um, I live in Boston, uh, which has lobsters and bike lanes. Um, someone made this nice <laughs> picture so that we could enjoy them both at the same time. Um, so, uh, so like about 20 years ago, Boston started putting in more bike lanes, right? And, um, and people started asking like, well, cool, so we've been putting in all these bike lanes, like, are they working? Are more people cycling? Are more people like using them? Is it safer? And, uh, and they kept asking. And, uh, and in particular, like car drivers were like, oh, like, it's, it, like we lost a lane over here. Like, is it all worth it? Um, and the city like stalled for a little while. And then so finally someone kind of leaked like, we haven't been counting cyclists. And it was like, wait, what? And it's like, nope, uh, we've been counting car drivers and literally everyone else. Uh, strollers, wheelchairs, cyclists, pedestrians, children, maybe squirrels, who knows? So in asking this question of like, oh, so how are the bike lanes working? They're like, we have them. So they had to, uh, they do now count cyclists separate from uh, pedestrians and other users of the road, but they couldn't figure out, like, they were not able to say if they were having more or, or less like traffic accidents, if it was making cyclists safer, or if anyone was even using the bike lanes. Uh, because they weren't counting it. So, like, you can't fix it if you can't see it. So it becomes this uh, thing of, like, well, you know, we can't fix a problem that we can't quantify. And so you want to be careful putting, like, two things into one category. Like, my other car is a Pinton novel. I guess it's sort of, like, in the spirit of Pinton because he's a little, like, kind of cerebral. But, like, you know, you can't drive a book to work. So um, not so far as I've noticed. So, um, yeah, so putting things into the, in, in like, you know, if you're not counting it or you're putting like too many things into one bucket, you're not going to have very useful information. So you want to make sure that you're not like taking the number of samples received and then using that to make your categories. And like I said, you want to step back. So how do we kind of like stretch our brains? So we talked about like, we like stereotype ourselves and we're certain we were places that we, it was impossible we were at. So, uh, so we have, you know, some challenges, right? Um, and, and we have like a, a racist, sexist, homophobic society that we live in and have all been like kind of soaking in for our entire lives. Not our fault, but you know, that's what we have. So, 
Um, so I would say the first thing is uh, to educate yourself. Um, and to kind of try and step out of like what it's like to be you and maybe think about like what it's like to be someone else. Kind of like the fun, right? Like, are you a Um But like, so one of the things that I try to do in my work is I, uh, and, and Twitter is amazing for this, uh, is to follow people who are not like me, especially activists and advocates for groups that I'm not part of. So, and it's great, it's passive, it doesn't involve them doing any work and me being like, oh, can you tell me, like, I, I need to know if, you know, I'm being sensitive to this, like, can you do a bunch of unpaid stuff for me and, and help me fix myself? Um, so you can just follow people that are not like you, like follow disability activists, and, uh, and especially if you find yourself, like, in a situation where, like, maybe you're like, oh, I, I, I'm building a community pool or not pool, um, and I weirdly don't know any black people. It's like, well, you should get on that and follow some folks and, uh, and try and get a better sense of what it's like to be someone who's not you. Um, up to until you're going to, like, uh, if you, you know, if you're doing this for your own edification, okay, fine. But if your company is paying you to, like, figure stuff out, then they could also pay someone from a marginalized group for their advocacy and expertise. Um, everyone likes money. That's where that slide's supposed to be. I don't know what happened with LibreOffice. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's that stuff, it's work, and it's work that we should be doing and thinking about. So um, another thing, like I said, I, I really like to think about the perspective of stuff and um, to get like a little bit more uh, on what I'm doing from outside of what I'm doing. It's, it's the same when you're coding too. Like, you know, like sometimes you're looking, you're looking, you're looking, and then you're like, all right, I'm going to just shut the computer down, go get dinner. And then you come back and you're like, oh, I was on the wrong branch the whole time. That's why nothing worked and nothing was connected. So it, it is the same with other work. Like stepping back and getting some perspective is really good. Like so you can kind of like, oh, maybe I'll read something from a different field. Or maybe I'll take a look at like what one of our like competitors or we're all cooperative competitors in open source. Like someone who's doing something similar to me but a little bit different. Like how did they approach the problem? And so I think that the perspective is a really good one and taking a, a step back from what you're doing. You can also, if you are lucky enough to have friends that like to, um, you know, complain about work, like you can ask them to like hear about a problem that you're working on. And it can be a trade, it can be over beers, uh, it doesn't have to be like a painful thing. But, um, you know, to kind of like get some perspective, because some sometimes someone will ask you a question that you will never have thought of, like where, um, you're listening and, or, or they're listening and they're like, oh, well, where did the number come from? And then you're like, oh, I haven't thought about that in months. Like, wow, okay, like, but it's a great question and now I have to explain it to someone who isn't, in, like, steeped in my work and it gives you a little bit more perspective. And then, um, finally, I would say to uh, accept suggestions um, uh, with grace. So, like, if someone says like, oh, that question's really weird and leading, or um, I was wondering why like you were like, this question, you know, this survey is for all contributors, and then I went through 37 questions about coding, and no one asked me about translation or setting up events, which is work, and uh, no one asked about like all of these other aspects of the community, like helping people in IRC, like, so if it's really all contributors, then where are all those other questions about the other types of contribution? And that's a real world example. I won't name names, so. So once you get these suggestions, you may have to trim up some stuff and fix your things. Um, and, uh, but this is better. The earlier you can do it, the better. Like, um, you know, it's, uh, most of those things don't go away, or if they do, it means like a whole group of people saw your stuff, one of them said something, and then everybody else was like, eh, not worth it, and went away. So you don't want that. So when someone gives you a suggestion like, hey, it seems like you're trying to do outreach here to like, you know, women undergrads in CS and some of the language, the mustache contest, not working, you know. So like just 
accept that gracefully, not with like, ah, oh, that's so much work. You can tell your friend that you complain to work about that part, but you don't tell the person who has taken the time to say, hey, I'm not actually invested in your work, but it could be better. So that's like a free gift, right? Like questions are love and um, patches should be welcome. So um, I have credits and I would be willing to take one or two questions, um, although I know it's a kind of an abstract uh, conversation. So thanks very much. Or we can take five minutes to the next thing. That's also fine. Yeah. If you do get questions, if you could repeat it for the camera, that would be great. Okay, great. Go on. Yeah, I love the example of uh, the bike lanes, like that they weren't being counted, or they're in an aggregate, and then you're trying to bring it into individual metrics. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had to work through a challenge like that, where there was an overgeneralization, and then like, how do you even start to peel back something that abstract and go through it methodically with people? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess there's two things. Either you can t take a look and see if there is something else that might be, uh, oh, sorry, so how do you work through the aggregate uh, data uh, collection problem? Um, so there's two things, like one, it might be that like you have another marker in there that helps you easily separate stuff. So like, um, you know, it, it's, uh, if you're trying to be like, oh, we were looking at like all women developers, but not separating by college students and professionals, but you were tracking age, so you might be able to figure it out. So that would be great and lucky for you, but if not, then you probably have to start with new data to look at that problem. So, yeah. Yeah, in the back, or in the middle, I guess. Um, this is kind of a general question, but do you ever have Yeah. How do you push that conversation forward to like it allow them to be a little more perceptive of really like success can't be that much of a five Cool. So the question was, how do you um, push the conversation forward when your boss has asked for a success metric that's too simplistic? Um, yeah, I would give them not too many more metrics than they asked for, but like maybe two more to kind of say, like, especially if one is like, so here's the thing you asked for. Here's like one that almost completely contradicts the simplisticness of the other metric. And then here's the one you should have asked for. <laughs> <laughs> if you can, but if you get, like, if someone says I want one number and you give them 40, it's not gonna happen. So you gotta keep it still, I think. All right. I've got a question for you. I mean, you've got title at the top of ethics. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to figure out where, um, you know, the question about uh, various decisions that have been made. You know, how do you quantify or even measure, maybe it's a, a very loose term, uh, about how whether something is ethical or otherwise? Uh, so how do you measure whether something is ethical or not? I guess, yeah, with the, yeah, it's, um, I think that's a really good question, and it's like always evolving. I think we're always learning a little bit more about that, especially like um, as you collect more stuff. I guess that what I'm advocating really is making sure that you're constantly stepping back and checking in on your work and looking at the way it affects the people that you're, you know, collecting information from, uh, to make sure that that makes sense. Um, in, in my mind, I think that uh, diversity and inclusivity is its own good. Um, I mean, you know, without tanking the project, but that uh, it helps us build better projects. It helps us build software that is less likely to exploit people or exclude people. And so, uh, so I would say, like, thinking about the diversity question, that is, in, in some sense, that, that helps you get to, like, a more ethical build. Does that answer your question? Sort <laughs> It's a big one. We can talk yeah, more, too. Question. Okay. One more. All right, one more if you have it. Yeah, all the way down there. Yeah. Oh, when you don't, so the question is, uh, how do you account for the double of? Uh, 
Yeah, so the question again is how do you go back if you didn't record whether, uh, you know, the dual marker of women and people of color? I, again, I don't, I think if you haven't tracked it and you, you might be able to do it through some case studies, like get some information on that, but if you didn't, I mean, that's why it's important to track these things is that if you didn't track it, then you only have like sort of a gloss of how it went down and what it was like. Um, and so, yeah, so people should be tracking stuff that is important, and I think that's really important. And it's, and it's like I said, it's, uh, it, it is sloppy to make too few categories and then try to make inferences. So thanks for your question. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Deb.